Hey guys, I'm Mikko and in this video I'm gonna show you how I created this Ghibli-esque painting using Procreate 5. And in this video specifically, I want to focus on the beginning and finishing touches part of the video, because those usually go by in a Procreate recording really quickly, but they're really important for how you can create a landscape and composition and in the end how you do those finishing touches. So we're gonna take a closer look at those and learn something by the end of all this. Okay, let's go. So the brush I'm using here is Larapuna and it's part of the new Procreate 5 exclusive brush set. The cool thing about this brush is that it creates a lot of texture with just few colors. As you can see here, I'm just using few hues, but I'm painting the blue sky in the background. And this is the most important part that I wish you can take out of this, is that I paint all the flat areas by hand, so I just don't fill it with a gradient and blur it in the end because this will create a small texture to the sky. It's not a lot, but it's still more interesting for the eye to look at than just having that paint bucket gradient type of a look to the sky. This is just my personal opinion, but when I have a huge print like the ones that you see here behind me, there it usually matters a lot how you have painted the large surfaces, because if it doesn't have visual interest, it somehow, I don't know, maybe this is just me, but it cheapens it a bit. So I'm using the same brush for most of the blocking. The Lara Puna brush is just pretty versatile brush, depending on the way you use it. The softer touches leave these sort of like blended edges, but when you press harder and don't tilt the brush, then you get these sort of more defined brush strokes. Halfway through this painting, I'm switching from this Larapuna brush that is exclusive to Procreate 5 to Jagged brush. And Jagged brush is already in your copy of Procreate. And it's a very versatile tool to use. You could do this whole painting with just that one brush. But the big thing to note here is that I'm not using tons of different brushes. It, I could do the whole thing with either of these two things. Jagged brush or Larapuna brush. I don't, you don't see me going to the brush menu all the time and switching between these things. When I switch to the jagged brush, that's it. I'm not switching back to the Larapuna brush anymore. I'm creating the rest of the painting with the same brush. And the reason I'm showing these two specific things is that I've been teaching concept art in schools for five years now and I've seen this process so many times that I know that a lot of students spend a lot of time in the brush menu picking up tools and adjusting their tools and just fiddling around with the settings when the, you could just focus on the painting instead and use that energy there because all this brain clutter that you have in your head when it comes to brushes, it's going to just slow you down and take away from the important parts, which is the painting. And another thing that I see a lot is that when the students start painting, I've seen it so many times that I thought it's worth mentioning, that the reason why I wanted to show you this footage of the screen is that I want to show you that most of the main blocking in the face happens so zoomed out that it doesn't matter what size of a iPad you have. You can do this entire thing with a smaller iPad or even iPhone screen because you don't need to zoom in. And the zooming in is like the biggest and easiest way to destroy your composition because when you're so close to the painting that you're ba basically your face is smushed into it, there's no way you can handle a composition if you don't see the whole thing. Even when you're doing oil paintings, you should always step back and this same applies to digital painting. You should have a clear view of the whole painting that you are doing and not get so close that you don't see the forest from the woods, in this case quite literally. So zooming out and using only 
one or two brushes is something I highly recommend. A quick note about how to paint trees at this point. I think I've done enough trees in my life that I can have some sort of insight into what challenges I have faced. So for me, what seems to work is to start with a darker color. So I start with the color that will remain as the shadow color of that foliage and then I work towards the light and try to have consistent shape language. And the way that I paint details, it's always relative to where the light is coming from. I watched a lot of Ghibli movies and the way Kazuo Oga, the background painter of most of Ghibli movies, does light on trees is that he paints the details closest to the light and closest to the camera. So, for example, if you have a bunch of trees, you don't need to paint all of the details in all of the trees. Just pick the areas that are closest to the focal point and closest to the camera, and that will sell the rest of the trees to have the same amount of detail. At the end of the video, you see me repeating this detail process to the front stones that are part of the stone wall in the picture, but I just do a little bit of details in the very corner of the first stones that are closest to the camera and then I just leave the rest as paint blobs because I think it already sells that the rest of them are rocks that have the same level of detail. So whenever you're doing detail on any surface just consider how close it is to the camera and where the light is coming from. When you are looking anything in the real world you're basically looking at things that are hit by sunlight. And when it comes to video game design, you are always leading the player to where the light is coming from. So same applies in pictures, I guess, that where you see light, your eye will follow. The shape language in these trees has this sort of like round repeating pattern, but I have about three different ways of showing this round shape. One of them is just the kind of outline of the round shape near the top of the trees and then there is this sort of more detail that has three different layers of colors that I show the local color, the shadow color and the edge color. That is happening in the kind of like mid-ground of the trees. The closest trees where I add the most individual foliage and detail, they are the closest to the camera and I try to have the most contrast there as well. Because at this phase, you see that I still have a lot of contrast in the very top of the trees that are very far away from the camera. And this is a mistake that I, at this phase, just don't notice yet. And it's something that I will fix in the very end. When painting any of these diagonal lines, that's the only part in this whole painting process that I'm really zoomed in. Because I just want to get a few of the houses right. And I want the angles to be precise. And these are the houses that have the most contrast and they are closest to the center of the picture. So those houses are the ones that matter. When you look at the houses that are in the background or on the outside of this village, they are just basically color blobs. But I have a few houses there to sell the detail and the rest I will let just like recede into the background. By the way, the very furthest houses I don't paint individually. They are just copy-pasted versions of the ones in the foreground. And then I use a clipping mask on top of them at low opacity to give them a bit of separation and distance to the foreground elements. In the foreground, I usually try to have elements that can communicate the scale of the scene. So for example, this fence and the stone fence, they are kind of easier to relate do for human beings because we know what size fences are. Instead of painting tons of humans just like walking in or out from the village, I think these fences tell a better story. I don't want to take away too much of the story from the viewer experience. You can kind of see yourself what this village is and what's happening in it. This scaffolding type structures that are in the village, but I was thinking mostly there is that if you were living inside this town, how would you navigate the different platforms and 
different height levels of the town. So I just wanted to have enough information to show that like you can take these ladders up and there are st stairs everywhere. And creating these pathways to me, it's one of those fun parts of a painting because I kind of love this sense of adventure that when I'm painting a picture like this, I kind of imagine living there and what it would be like to go all these like narrow pathways up to the trees and to the houses there. By the way, I'm very scared of heights, so this all will probably be very impossible for me, but somehow it just sparks that adventure mode in my brain and that's why I love doing paintings like this. Also that's why I love Ghibli movies. I think they are they just have enough imagination to make you imagine things that are outside of the movie, that what is happening within that world and I think that's the best type of imagination. When you don't over explain everything so that the viewer has a bit of thinking to do and they can make this experience personal. That's why I always suggest that you don't overdo details because there's always a chance that you might ruin the painting by taking away the personal experience from the viewer by over explaining things when they just want to be in there and explore it for themselves. At this point I take a look at the foliage and I think I don't have enough color punch in there so I do a little bit of adjusting here to make sure that they are within the boundaries of contrast but at the same time look interesting enough because the foliage in this piece is a very important part of the whole so I want it to be visually appealing enough so I do adjustments like adding an additive layer of the same layer and then adjusting the contrast so that the additive layer is showing only Q percent but it's already adjusted from curves so that it only affects the lightest parts of that foliage. I also do a lighten layer and then I add this lighten layer as clipping mask to the foliage and the lighten layer works in a way that anything you paint on a lighten layer will only show if that color is lighter than the layer below it that you are painting on. So I use this to kind of take out some of those deepest shadows in the highest parts of the trees because as I explained earlier there's too much contrast there and it makes it look like the top part of the trees are closer to the camera than they actually are. So I killed some of that contrast and also in these little branches because also detail is something that will bring elements closer to your eye and make them seem like they're closer. So I take away some of that contrast as well with that light and layer and then I just merge the clicking mask to the layer below. And using a clicking mask like this means that I don't have to create a complex selection of all these branches and foliage elements. Here I'm doing a drawing assist grid and then from the layer that has the houses I put the drawing assist on. So using this drawing assist I just create straight lines that are these sort of like decorative beams on the edges of the houses. Because I just wanted there to be more things to look at and have a bit of more visual appeal. When your eye gets to the village that there will be something more to look at. And using drawing assist in these elements, for me it's a very quick way to draw straight lines. Because usually if I were to draw straight lines in any other way, I would have to wait for that quick shape function to kick in. And in a situation where I have to draw this many lines, that would just take too much time. So having drawing assist on means that I can just instantly draw all the lines in perfect perspective in relation to these houses and just be done with it basically much quicker. And the reason why I've left these clouds in the background is because I already blocked in the most important parts when it comes to composition. So I know where the light and dark contrasts of the clouds are going to be. So that's why I added these very quick blobs in the beginning with that Larapuna brush. But here I've already switched to that jagged edge brush and I'm doing the detail of the clouds. And the reason why I left this as last 
is because I just love painting clouds and it's one of those sugar at the bottom of a very big coffee cup that I like to have as a motivation to finish the other parts of the piece so I get to do the fun part which for me is clouds. I'm thinking of doing a live stream where I can show the full process of painting clouds because it's quite a specific way that I do it and if somebody is interested in learning that just let me know in the comments below and I will try to make a stream happen where I just paint clouds and show the technical aspect of that. Basically at this phase of the painting I have all the foreground elements flattened to a single layer and here you see at the end that I'm using a lot of lighting tricks to kind of punch the mood of this painting. And the way I edit most of my paintings is that I use a lot of additive layers. For example, all of these foreground elements are now flattened to a single layer and I copy that layer and then I use curves so that only the lightest areas of the layer are remaining. And then I set that layer as a clipping mask and set that dark layer to blend mode additive. And with a mask on that clipping layer, I paint in these lights. And they are very low opacity brush strokes. So they are almost completely black, but a little bit of gray in the mask will like bring out that additive light into the picture. And here I recommend that you're very careful with how much light you add because you don't want to overexpose areas. So there's always a little bit of saturation and value left before it goes completely 100% saturated or blows out completely otherwise because that will also lead into those flat colors and I want to keep the eye moving so nothing has to be too important. So I do that to several parts of this image. I do that to the houses, I do that to the foliage and to the tree trunks and then in the end I have this piece. And you see that the final light adjustments, they add quite a bit to the mood of the image. So usually because this goes in like a two seconds in a painting, so I wanted to create this longer way of explaining what's happening in that sequence. So I hope that helps and if you have any questions ask them in the comment section below and if you want to have that sky tutorial please let me know and I'll try to see what I can do about that. Go and paint fun stuff and I'll see you guys in the next video. Okay, bye!